Hello everyone, uh, we will discuss paper 2. I think we already discussed anthropology paper 1 in the previous video. In this video, we will look into anthropology paper 2 of the just concluded uh, civil services mains examination 2023. Now, we have discussed paper 1 at length in the previous video. You will find the link for the video in the description. Please access it. Now, coming to paper 2. Uh, overall, I think paper 2 has been uh, much easier when compared to paper 1. It was much more easier, questions were predictable and uh, the surprise elements were very few compared to paper 1. And just like the other paper, if you could finish entire syllabus and if you did not leave anything, especially if you did not leave, uh, because most students tend to skip archaeology and fossils. If you did not skip archaeology or fossils and if you included, studied both of them quite well, then in this paper, you could have uh, re easily used choice to eliminate some difficult questions and uh, attempt questions which are your strengths and do them really well. And if you could do that, I think the paper was very, very well made. It's a very well, pa uh, well prepared paper and uh, those who prepared well could have aced it. So I think uh, for students who are good at analysis, good at essay kind of writing and who are, pre who are prepared well, you can expect, you can really score, easily score over 160 in paper 2. So, very few surprises are there and most questions are along predictable lines. So, I think anthropology optional has uh, delivered once again good scores and a good paper to the aspirants this year. So, anthropology as has been the trend in the recent years still continues to be a reliable and a good optional. Now, I am also proud to announce that in the test series that we have conducted over 23, 23 out of 28 questions uh, have appeared from the test series that I have organized here at La Excellence and uh, most of the students who wrote the exam have come back to me and told me and discussed the questions with me and felt that on the whole they were uh, feeling quite ease. They were at ease with the paper given the fact that a lot of things we have already discussed in discussions, uh, a lot of questions have already been asked and uh, delivered in the test as well. So, here I have shared, compared the 2023 mains questions and I have also compared the test series questions that have appeared from my test series and almost um, 23 out of the 28 questions are uh, very closely connected to the test series except a few like prehistoric rock art from Uttarakhand now that is too specific. So, uh, students generally prepare prehistoric rock art and whenever they study prehistoric rock art the focus is on beam weight curve but Uttarakhand is a very very specific question that is the only difficult question in the compulsory section. In the entire compulsory section that is the only difficult question and some questions are very very easy. For example, Dravidian languages I have asked in my test Dravidian languages in test 3 and an exact same question came in the examination. I have asked karma, rebirth and varna in the test and exact same question of karma and rebirth has come. I have asked annihilation of caste in the test. Annihilation of caste has also been asked here. We discussed Ramapitakas, Sivapitakas and they have asked uh, Sivapitakas, Ramapitakas in two places. We have discussed uh, ethnicity and ethnic identity in the question. I, I gave three, three questions on ethnicity given the money ongoing crisis, ethnic crisis in Manipur and uh, a question on ethnicity was along expected lines and uh, it was asked. Then I asked a question on Purusharthas, same question appeared again here like that. And Mesolithic, we discussed Mesolithic question and Mesolithic uh, was asked in the examination. We discussed Guhas, Guha was asked. We talked about uh, PVTG and uh, a question on PVTG also appeared in the examination. So, in that sense, a lot of questions were the ones which you could prepare and uh, easily compare. And I asked SC Roy. So, I asked SC Roy in two places. In two questions, I have asked SC Roy and they have asked SC Roy in the examination also. Likewise, I discussed various kinds of tribal classification and they have asked that question on geographical classification of tribal people. So, in that sense, uh, if you prepare well, complete syllabus and have a good mentor and write a reliable test series, the paper is very much attemptable and very much doable. And also if you see the paper, 
what I noticed is that the emphasis on tribes is slightly has slightly reduced. We only have uh, seven questions from tribes this year, and the emphasis on archaeology and fossils has increased. So we have something like six questions from archaeology and fossils, and this is where the difficulty lies because most questions from tribes are easy, and uh, the difficulty lied uh, was largely with the questions from archaeology and fossils. And likewise, in Indian anthropology. They have asked highest number of questions came from section the first five units that is Indian anthropology of these six questions are from caste caste had uh, many questions in this year's paper something like six questions are in one way or another related to caste and they also asked a good number of questions from unit two Indian demography so those questions have also appeared in this year's paper right and choice wise I think uh, as with paper 1, they are mixing different sections. So, even in paper 2, they are trying to make sure in the choice questions, in the non compulsory questions, uh, one question is from Indian anthropology, one question is from tribal anthropology, uh, another question is from archaeology. So, if you look at the question number 4, in question number 4, for example, one question was PVTG tribes, 4B is slightly about Indian demography and 4C is caste mobility. So, most questions are like something on caste or village studies, something on tribes and another question is from archaeology. And the only other, uh, the only exception was 7th question. In 7th question, all the 3 sub questions are mostly from tribal discussion, tribal parts. And uh, if you look at also 2, question 2, first question is on tribes, second question is Indus Valley archaeology and third question is on impact of Jainism. Likewise, question number three, third question is Sanskritization, first question is Sanskritization, second is Mesolithic and the third question, last question is uh, also Pancha is uh, tribes. So, if you see in third question, one was from caste, one was from tribe, another is from archaeology. So, that is how different topics are being covered under one question. So, they are trying to make sure you do not skip any part, you include all the different parts in your discussion that is the objective in the inserting a paper like this and comparatively uh, section b was much more easier so i think the sixth question was slightly difficult on the difficult side because of civalics and all that you can't it is generally difficult to write 15 marks on civalics so if you could skip sixth question seventh question is easy eighth question is easy so seventh and eighth are very easy questions and in section a question three Question 3 is very very easy in section A compared to 2 and 4. So, I would advise students to skip 6 and uh, try definitely make sure you write 3. Skip 6, definitely write 3 and uh, choose 2 questions from question 2, question 4, question 7, question 8. So, you have to do, uh, choose 2 questions from 7, 8 and 2, 4. You can choose as per your convenience. So, try to make sure 6 was on the difficult side if you could skip 6 and ensure you definitely wrote 3. So, anthropology optional on the whole has been easy and paper 2 is much more easier than paper 1 and even this year's paper shows the same trend to us, right. With that, on that note, let us get into more detailed discussion. What is the first question? The first question is uh, archaeology. It is about material culture and archaeology. This is a very analytical question. It is not a factual question. It is a analytical question. Archaeology is nothing but study of the past using material remains. Study of the past using material refined remains. So, first define what is archaeology and uh, process. How does archaeology study past using material remains and what are the different material remains? This include uh, stone tools, fossils, bone fragments or uh, pottery. It can include ruins of urban civilization. It can include uh, burials, can include uh, seals, religious uh, figures, all of these. So, all of these are the various material culture through which archaeology attempts to study the past. And then uh, discuss the challenges that we face in studying the past. And some of the challenges we face in studying the past is basically in dating. How do you date, establish date time that is through dating or what? is the mechanism through which we can establish chronology. So, dating and chronology is an issue and uh, likewise you can uh, talk about other challenges that is like identifying 
setting up a chronology and setting up an order of events and then comparing these events across different parts of the country and trying to find correlations and comparing these events and trying to make them part of the global stage and also making sure that uh, identifying similarities in different artifacts and ensuring that they all form a common cultural area. This we see in the study of IVC where different artifacts are all brought together to make them into a common cultural zone of Indus Valley. So, this is the uh, material culture and archaeology. Next is uh, interface between Purushartha and Ashrama. So, this is a famous diagram which talks of which uh, links Purusharthas and Ashramas together into a single uh, entity. Purusharthas are the four goals of life, Ashramas are the four stages of life. So, just discuss at which stage of life, which goal of life is taken quite seriously and elaborate on the four Purusharthas and the four Ashramas and draw the other diagram about how as we pass from one stage of life to another different Purusharthas uh, step in and they are important and how we can connect all of this to karma and rebirth. And uh, in questions like this, please try to ensure you discuss present relevance. Most students in paper 2, you have to realize that present relevance can add brownie points. So, in the end, try to add present relevance to distinguish your questions from others. So, discuss the present relevance of Purusharthas and Ashramas to Indian society today. Next question is Jajimani. This is a very, very easy question. So, you should be able to... Uh, leverage this question and hit a sixer in this question. So, Jajimani system, uh, define it as per William Weiser, what William, how William Weiser studied this and you can also give the definition of Harold Gould for the study of Jajimani system, draw the diagram, discuss its features and then talk about continuity and change. First change, it has undergone lot of change because of the uh, emergence of market economy because of urbanization, industrialization, we see a lot of change in Jajmani system. So, discuss the change aspects in Jajmani system as a result of the different elements and talk about continuity. Do you find what, where do you find continuity? Continuity we see largely in the sense that these previous castes who are in Jajmani still maintain some kind of, uh, they maintain some kind of economic or cultural relationship or social relationship but the economic relationship has by and large declined. So, the groups maintain some kind of economic relationship while the uh, cultural relationship and social relationship while the economic relationship itself has come down. And even economically, though they do not operate anymore in the old occupational fold, what we see economically now is that people are trying to, in the new economic market economy, they still try to use the old Jajmani friendship ties or relationship ties to uh, cooperate and organize work, that is all. The next question is prehistoric uh, rock art from Uttarakhand. Now, this is a this is the most difficult question if you ask me in the entire paper because uh, nobody, no students generally do not prepare about prehistoric rock from Uttarakhand. Most of you prepare prehistoric rock art from central India, Bhimbetka. But they have asked from Uttarakhand. So, these are some famous sites prehistoric rock art sites in Uttarakhand, of these the most important is Laku Diyar Caves in Almora. So, most of these are near in Almora district of Uttarakhand and some are in Raniket that is they are in the foothills, Himalayan foothills. So, Patarkot stone paintings is another prehistoric rock art, Chaubatia near Raniket and Dauli Ganga Valley. These are some of the rock art, prehistoric rock arts that we find in uh, Uttarakhand. So, this is the painting from Laku Diyar Caves. This is the prehistoric painting from Laku Diyar Caves and this is another prehistoric painting from Almora that has recently been discovered. So, just uh, I think no students would have generally not prepared for this. So, here just briefly discuss prehistoric rock art, how it evolved and its significance in the cultural development. And if you know any, if you remember Almora or Raniket, you can just mention one or two sites. Next, the next question is uh, religious pluralism and uh, social solidarity. So, here first define religious pluralism. Religious pluralism means having, it is not just syncretic culture, that is it is not about different cultural elements mixing together, that is not Pluralism. Pluralism means mutual tolerance 
among different faiths mutual tolerance among different faiths and discuss briefly historically how we've had religious pluralism in india due to coexistence of brahmanism jainism buddhism and then christianity uh, islam also coexisted with the other indian religions for a long time so discuss the history of pluralism and when you are explaining pluralism you can draw a triangle to describe the features of pluralism this includes freedom of religion and it also includes mutual tolerance and large lastly fertility of ideas lastly fertility of ideas these are the three uh, things that we have to know about religious pluralism and then discuss how it contributes to social solidarity uh, according to here you can quote one social scientist steve bruce steve bruce says that religious pluralism has helped undermine communal basis of religious orthodoxy in india he is saying that the presence of religious pluralism in a multicultural society is needed to fight communalism so for example right now ganesh chaturthi festivities are going on they are celebrated by all sections of society uh, if you have diwali both hindus muslims are together if you have eid uh, hindus also celebrate eid and so on so that is what you mean by religious pluralism and he says religious pluralism is needed to tackle communalism or religious conflict and polarization he also says pluralism will result in harmony and fraternity which ultimately are needed for secularism and uh, plurality is functional to society by reducing conflicts respecting each other and is counter ideology to exclusion of some section so uh, this ideology of pluralism promotes national integration and greater social intercourse and acts as a an antidote against communal forces or divisive elements in the society that is what uh, he means by social solidarity next is uh, tribes are backward hindus by g s gurie so here this is a uh, also a very easy and straight forward question most often we discuss this issue when we are talking about definition of tribe so first discuss gurie and uh, gurie's indological approach his approach to study society is indological and uh, is a nationalist approach so gurie was reacting to verrier elvin and verrier elvin's idea of isolation so reacting to that he said tribes are backward hindus that is to say he said uh, tribal people have always tribes were always in contact with hinduism they were always in contact with hinduism and uh, they are assimilated into hindu culture to various degrees they are assimilated into hindu culture to various degrees and based on that he also classified based on this he classified tribes into three categories some are called as hinduized tribes some are partially hinduized tribes and somebody is called as a hill section tribes so he based on the extent of contact he uh classified tribes into hinduized tribes partially hinduized tribes and hill section tribes and he said tribes are uh, backward because of imperfect integration today tribes are backward not because they are a different society but it is just because of absence of imperfect integration or due to cultural lag you can link this to the idea of william ogburn that was asked in paper 1 of cultural lag and he gives examples of santals gonds bills who have all been in under greater contact of hinduism and hence have uh, come under greater uh, influence of hindu religion and uh, because of this because of all of this his vision for tribal development his vision for tribal development is to incorporation of hindus into incorporation of tribes into hindu belt into hindu religion and this process has been called as hinduai deshan and here you can link all of this to 
the idea of N.K. Bose. N.K. Bose called this kind of thinking as Hindu mode of tribal absorption. This is what he said. Next, you can you need not agree with him. You can point out the criticism or alternative view to Gurye. So Gurye's view is problematic because it is failing to Gurye's view is ethnocentric and lacks culture relativism. It is assuming that tribes are Hindus and it is failing to protect their, give them, respect their individual faith. Virginius Kaka criticizes Kaka uh, Gurye's view and says Gurye is a view is reductionist and it is failing to look at tribal people and tribal culture in their own right. And Elvin also criticized this and uh, many today believe that this kind of view leads to coercion exploitation and domination of tribals by outsiders. Hence, to avoid this only, it may also lead to attack of culture. It may also lead to cultural attack on tribal people and failure to appreciate their unique culture. And that is why in Panchashil, we have also said we need to promote and protect tribal culture and take care of it. So, discuss what Guria said, discuss the criticism and finally, what is the final view on this matter. 2B. 2B is about IBC as the first civilization, first settlement of the big civilization, comment critically. So, we can take two views. For this answer, you say yes, it is the first settlement, first civilization within Indian subcontinent. And then give the features of IBC, how town planning, urban settlements, their religion, their economy, their society and the larger extent of IVC to show it is the largest of all the ancient civilizations. And then also uh, disagree and you can say no, it is first civilization in Indian subcontinent, but it is not the first in the world. At the world level, we have the Mesopotamian civilization and Egyptian civilization which came before uh, IVC Indus Valley civilization and also the other point here is that in Indus Valley, there is absence of deciphered script. It lacks deciphered script. Because of the absence of script that we have, but we could not decipher in IVC region, now what happens is that uh, we are not able to fully understand the extent of civilization and the extent of cultural progress that was made in this uh, civilization. So, we have to also discuss those features in this context. Next is about Jainism. So, discuss basic tenets of Jainism and its impact on Indian society. So, basic tenets are the Triratnas and you also have these five ideas that is right faith, right knowledge, right action and Ahimsa, Satya, Asteya, Aparigraha and Brahmacharya. These are the five important ideas that we have to know about Jainism and discuss their impact on Indian society. This is more or less similar to Buddhism. So, discuss their impact in terms of social, uh, religious, economic, political and cultural just discuss two, three points for each of these uh, dimension. Next, third question, 3a. Three 3a is about Sanskritization. So, this is a very easy question. They are asking Sanskritization is a culture bound concept, critically comment to assess the strengths and limitations of this concept in developing a theoretical framework. So, just discuss how you know about Sanskritization that is introduction, first define it, introduction and define, define it as a measure of cultural emulation of upper caste by lower caste. It was studied by M. N. Srinivas through a structural functionalist framework and it is based on a study of uh, Rampura village in Mysore. So, discuss all that and uh, discuss the features of Sanskritization. It is a group activity, it is not individual activity, uh, it is time taking process, there is no guarantee and Sanskritization leads to 
positional change of a jati and not structural change of the caste system and it is also seen as a safety wall for caste and then discuss prerequisites of Sanskritization and uh, discuss the impact of Sanskritization on the culture of people and lastly also discuss the criticism of this concept. Many said Sanskritization is not universally seen and today people are no longer Sanskritizing and also many discuss this as a social change. This is not social change but this is only cultural change and so on. So, discuss all these things and give examples. You can give many examples of uh, Sanskritization like Tori Tappers, Teli caste, Nonias, how different castes have mobilized in together and achieved mobility and through Sanskritization. You can discuss all of that. So, it is a very simple and easy question. Next question is uh, Mesolithic. Now, Mesolithic was asked in first paper also. So, this is also an extension of that only. Uh, whether Mesolithic culture was the first step towards sedentary way of life. Yes, it was the first step because Mesolithic represents some kind of transition between uh, uh, the hunter gatherer. So, you have two extremes. So, one is Paleolithic, another is Neolithic. Neolithic represent agricultural way of life. This represents hunting gathering way of life and Mesolithic is a transitionary stage between these two. So, describe the different cultural features of Mesolithic that uh, tell to us, that reveal to us how this whole process is a transitional stage between the two other extremes of hunting, gathering and agricultural way of life. That is it. Next is uh, critically examine the impact of modern, this is highly analytical question, 3C is a very analytical question because here you are talking about the impact of modern democratic institutions on contemporary tribal societies illustrate with suitable ethnographic examples. So, what is the impact of modern democratic institutions on tribal societies? So, we can talk about uh, generally how state first talk about positives, talk about positives and how state various policies by the state like fifth schedule. 6th schedule, Panch Shil and uh, we also have tribal subplan, we have uh, various welfare activities for tribal people, uh, developmental activities for tribal people and so on and also proactively judiciary, judiciary, how judiciary helped in uh, protecting tribal rights. Here you can talk about various judgments like Samatha judgment, you can talk about uh, Niyamgiri judgment in, in the context of FRA. So, how they have all led to better life for tribal people and then also talk about negatives and here of course, I forgot the most important, please also include Panchayat Raj or PRIs, discuss about how PRIs have also led to PRIs and in particular refer to PISA, PISA 1996, FRA 2006. So, refer to these two legislations, how PISA uh, helped in uh, creating grassroots level democratic institutions for tribal people and also how FRA, Forest Rights Act uh, helped in promoting tribal rights and tribal ownership over forests. So, you can include all these two examples as well and then discuss the negatives of negatives of uh, these policies. So, you can talk about how for example, displacement is happening, land alienation is happening and then failure of resettlement and rehabilitation, how all of that is impacting people and uh, failure and along with this, we also can see in these institutions, there is domination of outsiders, domination by outsiders and then exploitation by nexus between outsiders and how all of this is leading to poverty, indebtedness 
and land grabbing along with that you can also discuss under negatives uh, the various ways in which these institutions are not functioning for example in most of these fifth and sixth schedules non tribals are dominating over tribals or within tribals there is conflict and some of these institutions are coming in conflict with traditional tribal political systems for example among the oda orao tribe we have something called as pada panchayat so pada panchayat is a panchayat of elders so the elders council and the tribal uh, panchayat system is uh, panchayat system under the modern system are both coming under conflict and so on so we can discuss the negative and finally suggest way forward under conflict here you can also include uh, tribal councils traditional tribal councils in uh, northeast traditional tribal councils in northeast and so on so that is 3c next pvtg it's a very classic question in fact i asked this question in my exam in my test series also it's a very classic and simple and easy question so define what is pvtg and in india we have roughly 75 pvtgs as per ministry of tribal development discuss some list give list of some important pvtgs and discuss the problems they are facing what are the different problems they are facing such as hunger malnutrition depletion of forests land alienation and displacement uh, they are also having issues in classification that is some of the pvtgs are not some tribes are uh, identified as pvtg but they are not listed as st they are not listed as st but they are included as pvtg for example paudi buya tribe which suffered under posco project abuj maria in uh, orissa jharkhand they have they are all pvtgs but they don't have st status likewise saharia is a tribe that is uh, suffering through bonded labor systems like hali the juwangs have a goatee system of bonded labor then some of these pvtgs are experiencing forced sterilization then fri gives pvtgs habitat rights but this is not implemented and there is no cl clarity and their culture is also under threat because of loss of indigenous knowledge and language and uh, they are very few in number so there is increasing challenge or increasing problem of in breeding there is their genetic fitness is being lost because they are easily vulnerable to diseases so and then all of these are the challenges and the way forward you can suggest uh, some of the findings of kaka committee in kaka committee they have said we should follow odisha model in odisha uh, for example pvtg specific micro projects were launched pvtg specific micro projects were launched we can discuss that and we can say that the special funds allotted to pvtgs under article 275 one special grant should also be implemented and here please uh, include the pvtg mission that was announced in this year's budget in the budget this year the prime minister announced the pvtg mission though so i think the question was inspired from the fact that in the budget itself we had a pvtg special pvtg mission so in this budget announced in february by the finance minister they have uh, listed out a special mission for pvtgs that is fourth a next fourth b is about uh, i think one moment yes fourth b is about uh, risley and sarkar classification this is a new kind of question because usually they ask risley or they ask sarkar or they ask guha but here they asked risley sarkar and they asked us to compare them so just list out broadly what is the basis for risley's classification and what is the basis for sarkar's risley's is old and it is based on old anthropometric measurements sarkar's is new and it is not just anthropology anthropometric measurements but sarkar's approach also takes into account some serological criteria and other migratory patterns that's all so describe what is risley uh, what is the basis for risley's classification and what are his categories what is our sarkar's approach and what are his categories and that's all so this is risley's uh, classification it is based on four indices stature nasal index cephalic index and orbito nasal index 
and uh, according to that he has given us seven he has classified indians into seven categories turco iranian indo aryan saito dravidian aryo dravidian mongolo dravidian mongoloid and dravidian and uh, risley also believes that caste has a racial basis and he studied caste hierarchy through nasal index that means according to him longer noses are seen in higher caste and broader noses are seen in uh, yes longer noses in higher caste and broader noses in lower caste that is risley's classification and then we can discuss sarkar's classification that's it so that is how you can answer this question next is caste mobility so this is also a very easy question and it is straight from syllabus and uh, it is also related to the other question on caste that is sanskritization so first define mobility and uh, please uh, highlight that mobility was not a recent phenomena no it is not a recent phenomena mobility has always existed in caste system through ages and uh, here using indology first discuss the nature of mobility in caste system what is the nature of mobility in the caste system mobility is always group mobility is always group mobility but not individual mobility it is always a group mobility but never a individual mobility in caste system so describe that point and uh, how historically various kinds of mobility were seen just discuss historically how we had different kinds of mobility that is different kings like shat uh, different shudra castes like shivaji even the shatakarni shataka gautami putra shatakarni and other shatavana rulers how they all claimed successfully reached kshatriya status and this is done through warfare annexation so the mobility has been achieved historically through war through using uh, religion or to expansion so military means was the primary mechanism through which mobility was achieved and then sanskritization was another mechanism so here under empirical context along with conquest and military expansion we can talk about the role of sanskritization studied by mn srinivas in achieving caste mobility and finally indological view discuss indological view for indological view you can use gs gurie and say indological view primarily equates caste with jati with varna and indological view indological view believes that uh, mobility within caste varna mobility does not exist but empirically we do see that there is mobility so indological view takes one orientation whereas uh, empirically we have a different orientation please highlight that difference and that's it so that is how so in fact i would suggest if you are writing third question please don't write fourth question because both of them have some repetition both of them involve uh, caste mobility and sanskritization so you must be smart if uh, when you are choosing choice questions make sure you don't choose questions that are repetitive choose questions that are distinct from one another so your content for caste mobility and your content for sanskritization both of them will have some overlap so try to avoid 3 and 4 as a combination if you are writing 3 don't write 4 if you are writing 4 don't write 3 next we move on to section b section b fifth question uh, is also very easy it is about scheduled areas so scheduled areas uh, are seen largely in uh, central india so describe scheduled areas or what we call as regions coming under fifth schedule so describe what is fifth schedule what are its provisions uh, like governor's report tribes advisory council and uh, governor special powers and discuss the problems mentioned in kaka report in the working of uh, fifth schedule areas discuss the problems and discuss the reforms or way forward and in the future kaka committee is pointing out that fifth schedule compare fifth and sixth so this is sixth schedule areas so he says that sixth schedule is promo is participatory in nature whereas fifth schedule is uh, paternalistic in nature and he proposes that in the long term we must promote we must bring all the fifth schedule areas into sixth schedule as well that is we must increase the pr presence of sixth schedule and reduce the presence of fifth schedule and he is also saying that for example if you see this figure in uh, 
states like Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, though they have tribal population, even West Bengal. In all these states, though they have tribal population, they do not have fifth schedule areas. So, he, uh, we have to also make sure that these parts also implement fifth schedule provisions. That is scheduled areas. Next is Ramapitaka, Sivapitaka debate. Even this question, there is repetition. So, 5b is about Ramapitaka, Sivapitaka debate, and uh, 6c is also about the same thing. There are Sivalik deposits and uh, neogene fossil primates. So, both are again quite similar. So, if you are writing 5b, you try to avoid 5b is compulsory anyway. So, it is better to avoid 6 because we will end up repeating our content for Ramapitaka and also for Sivalik deposits. So, both are similar. So, discuss the issue, this is very easy and it is a very, uh, it is a question that has been asked multiple times and it is very, very static question. So, first define what these, these are all ex examples of fossils that were found in Siwalik. So, we call them as Siwalik fossils and then describe what is Ramapithecus. So, Ramapithecus was uh, described in the 1960s as a possible human ancestor and this was based on dental and cranial fossils. We identified this based on dental and cranial fossils and the proponents of this theory, they argued that these fossils showed hominin like features. So, initially it was believed that Ramapithecus would have been a hominin that is it would have been an ancestor to human. So, the hominin characters that we saw were dental similarities and uh, they believed it represented an early stage in the evolution of humans. But if this were true, they believed that the split between ape and human, ape human divide they believe would have happened in Asia with Ramapithecus and did not happen in Africa. That is the view they initially took. And Sivapithecus was a, this is another also another hominoid species and we also only have dental and some cranial remains. And Sivapithecus was seen as a extinct ape. This is a, an ancestor to the extinct ape and uh, Today, we believe that it is more closely related to Oran Gutan than to Hominin. So, Sivapithecus from the beginning was uh, discussed, was believed to be ancestor to ape, whereas Ramapithecus they thought was an ancestor to human. And they thought Ramapith if Ramapithecus is ancestor to human, then the idea was that uh, human ape divide would have happened in India and not in Africa as was thought initially. And uh, the debate is about morphological interpretations, that is, Ramapithecus, is it Hominin? or hominoid, Sivapithecus, is it human or is it ape? And second is taxonomic classification, that is where do you place them? Where do you place? That is, is Ramapithecus ancestor to human or is this ancestor to ape or not? And finally, this uh, debate has been resolved as you discovered more and more fossils in Africa and today we believe that the ape-human split happened in Africa itself and uh, the fossils like R.D. Pithecus and Australopithecus, they are actually the fossils through which ape slowly gave rise to humans and Ramapithecus and Sivapithecus do not have anything to do with human ancestry and even today both are considered as ancestors to ancestral, both are considered as ancestral ape fossils, that is all. So, that is how we conclude this debate. Next question is village as a little republic, village as a little republic. So, this is uh, basically a view proposed by Indologists. This is basically a view proposed by Indologists. Indologists like uh, Charles Metcalf, James Mill, they have proposed this view that village is a little republic, that is village is isolated. So, uh, it is uh, almost self-sufficient, it is living autonomously on its own and all that. And this view of uh, it as a little republic is also called as a book view. But later when we had village studies, we discovered that villages are not really little republics. It showed that this notion is incorrect and uh, we got to know that villages interact with the larger civilization and villages have always been existing as part of great little traditions, they were part of sacred uh, complexes and so on. So, this is whole question is about the concept of Indian village and the village studies. Next is Dravidian language and their subgroups. This is also a question that I asked in my test series. So, last year there was a question on Austro-Asiatic languages and uh, even that question I asked in my last year test series and this year I thought 
maybe they will pick on dravidian languages and i asked the question on dravidian language and uh, as expected there was a question on dravidian language in the examination so discuss what are dravidian languages is the oldest spoken language and discuss the broad subgroups these are the broad subgroups there is south dravidian central north dravidian and uh, this many students skip brahui brahu is a uh, dravidian language that is spoken outside india in uh, pakistan and afghanistan and then finally discuss challenges faced by dravidian languages especially uh, challenges faced by some of the regional languages and also through tribal languages like gondi because gondi is also a uh, dravidian language and discuss some measures to preserve them the next question is uh, karma and rebirth this is very easy discuss karma the concept of karma as uh, predestination and discuss the concept of uh, rebirth how all these are connected to the idea of moksha and uh, features of karma and uh, features of rebirth and uh, significance of karma positives of karma negatives of karma positives are it is creating social order it is uh, creating better social regulations negatives are it is justifying caste system it creates an attitude of fatalism and finally discuss the present relevance of karma and rebirth that's it next is uh, 6a even this question i have asked in the examination this is about annihilation of caste so here first define it b r ambedkar was a person to talk about annihilation of caste and uh, how did b r ambedkar believe annihilation could be possible it could be done through inter caste marriages inter caste marriages are one way to achieve annihilation of caste or he also talked about uh, conversions religious conversions or another way through which we can achieve annihilation of caste and uh, then discuss future of caste system in the light of various proactive measures so many believed that caste annihilation is possible yes as they believed that the industrialization caste will shift to class system or many believed that as uh, we modernize and westernize also traditional identity like caste will lose its relevance but then no another view is no we can't have annihilation of caste because of various policies like reservations caste based politics emergence of caste associations caste movements because of all of this caste identities are strengthening in india and caste identities are being used to make demands on the state for social justice caste identities are being used to make demands on the state for social justice so we can write that point also and say uh, annihilation of caste is may not be possible and here you can describe the idea of gopal guru in the end where gopal guru says in india mobilization against caste requires mobilization on the basis of caste so say that people are trying to fight caste system by mobilizing through caste identity that is those like dalits and other uh, underprivileged sections are using caste identities to make greater demands on the state so that caste hierarchy can be brought down so discuss that point that is uh, caste movements or subaltern politics subaltern politics or subaltern movements are giving rise to caste based demands for social justice hence caste uh, by and we can achieve annihilation of caste hierarchy and caste inequality but we are achieving that you again using caste identity so in the one in that sense in the future caste inequalities may be fought and reduced but that is being achieved by again using caste identities that's it next question is ethnicity and ethnic identity this is a expected question because of what is happening in manipur presently so that's how current affairs can have a bearing on the questions that are being asked since there was a pvtg mission announced in the budget a pvtg question was asked in the paper likewise uh, since there is a ongoing ethnic conflict in manipur a uh, question based on ethnicity and ethno nationalism has also been asked so he said distinguish between ethnic identity and ethnicity so please first define both of them ethnicity means it's a concept 
ethnic identity is the application of the concept to create certain labels or identities ethnicity means uh, the fact that different people ethnicity means it is the idea that uh, those who share common culture have some kind of affinity towards each other ethnic identity means using this common culture as a marker to demand to mobilize together and make common demands for justice so here they are asking different factors that can uh, be responsible for ethnic conflict in tribal areas so the different factors can be uh, all of these economic backwardness fear of political marginalization this can happen due to uh, changes in democratic system like imposition of fifth sixth schedule imposition of outside systems like elections or loss of distinctive culture this is the case with bodos or migration and demographic changes is happening in assam tribes of assam are fighting because of this or failure of six schedule provisions this happened in meghalaya and uh, the geographical location along international borders and cross border support is also one of the reasons for the presence of strong autonomy movements and uh, discuss various case studies while talking about this discuss the different case studies for example you can take about naga movement talk about naga movement presently ongoing bodo movement along with that kashmir is also an ethnic movement dravidian movement in india or the khalistan movement in punjab so all of these are or jharkhand movement all these are examples of ethnic movement so just discuss the broad factors define the concepts and then talk about the different uh, ethnic movements that had uh, happened in india next is shivalik deposits show a variety of neogene fossil primates this question is again about uh, ramapithecus and sivapithecus so examiner has taken a deep love for uh, uh, ramapithecus and sivapithecus this year so we find this question being repeated two times so we discussed this already so we will not delve into the details of what this question can be that's why i said try to avoid six because if you write six you will end up repeating yourself next is shifting terrains of tribal policies in colonial and post colonial period so differentiate between how colonial state approach tribal issue compared to how in the post independence period how we are approaching in the colonial period it was mostly economic drain and it was mostly about exploitation and we see this in the land revenue policies we see this in forest policies we also see this in terms of uh, policies like uh, excluded and partial excluded areas that were imposed and culturally in the post in the colonial period culturally they try to bring tribals under christian fold by encouraging missionaries so all of these happen and in the post independence period we see that greater we see the uh, approach of integration that is the guiding light integration and uh, panchashil this philosophy has been taken and now along with this we also have national development agenda and along with this ideas like environmental conservation have come to the forefront and uh, that is also we also talk about welfare policies all these have been the driving force and some of these have benefited tribes others have actually harmed tribes so integration panchashil and we are also talking about cultural rights that is protecting their culture so some policies like integration panchashil welfare policies these had had positive impact on tribes these two have had positive impact on tribes whereas national development and environmental conservation they have had negative impacts and that is how we see land alienation we see displacement we see national parks being set up and tribes being asked to vacate and so on to discuss all of those issues next question and uh, discuss panchashil like this and uh, next question is about uh, impact of displacement on tribal communities especially with uh, focus on women so whenever there is displacement we will have this sarnia's eight fold risk he talks about eight risks that communities face whenever they are displaced and you can also use walter fernandez's statistics how walter fernandez has said that 40% of all displaced have been uh, tribals and with particular reference to in women we have to look at some case studies so ram ahuja is one who studied the impact of displacement especially on women 
and uh, these case studies i shared this on the anthro abhyas group the link to the group can be found in the description so there i shared this uh, research paper which talks about uh, impact of displacement on women in india and this is a research paper which talks about impact of uh, displacement on women uh, especially in northeast india especially in northeast india so you can use both these papers to get the content for this uh, topic next question is 7c this is about role of anthropology in nation building so you can break down nation building into different components so nation building in terms of national integration of different communities integration of different communities or uh, nation building can also be in terms of creating a common political consciousness it can also be in terms of resolving ethnic conflicts or uh, regional conflicts or nation building can also happen through development here talk about role of anthropology in education in providing health care in ensuring livelihood in campaigns like swachh bharat here you can talk about shg movement or in healthcare talk about how anthropological knowledge can help in promoting vaccination or uh, eradicating malnutrition we talked about yesterday protein calorie deficiency diseases how understanding of those can help us uh, overcome cultural problems so all of this you can discuss and discuss with lot of case studies and how do you get case studies again like i said yesterday reading test books has its benefit ember and ember has a lot of case studies on this in the last chapter anthropo contemporary anthropology in one of the final chapters it's called anthropology and the world today or contemporary anthropology there they give multiple examples of how anthropology can be used in uh, real life problems so this question is about what we can call as action anthropology or uh, applied anthropology right discuss these multiple points next is uh, distribution of tribes in different geographical regions so this is the geographical classification of tribes northeast central south north and islands describe some major tribes in each region and in case of andaman and nicobar you can give a profile because there are just six tribes in andaman and nicobar list out the six tribes of these first four are in andaman the bottom two are in nicobar the first four are negrito racial stock the last two are mongoloid racial stock and you can use data from this st profile of state wise what is the number of tribes and as you can see odisha has the largest number of tribes state wise and this is the regional distribution of tribes in india you can draw a map like this and show how uh, tribal distribution and concentration in different parts of india and this gives the share of each tribe madhya pradesh has the largest tribal population in the entire country and uh, distribution of sts by state you can draw charts like this and show and here you have the most populous tribes like bills and this chart gives you the least popular tribes so all of these are pvtg so if you want pvtg examples you can take from here and finally they ask the distinct institutional features of tribal society so talk about different things like uh, gotuls you can talk about their traditional cultural things like pada panchayats their economic systems their other cultural systems like matrilineal uh polygyny polygamy polygyny polyandry you can talk about their festivals like sarhul their religious beliefs like totemism their sacred groves all of this become part of little traditions and we can also discuss certain negative cultural features when they say cultural features they need not only be positive negatives like head hunting in nagas uh Kill burial of uh, human sacrifices in cones, killing of infants in mizos, and so on. So we can discuss about the negative cultural features also. And then we say uh, we have to use ethnocentric uh, framework. We cannot use ethnocentric framework to study them. We must use a cultural relativism framework. But if some tribal practices are negative, then we can use uh, human rights as a benchmark to evaluate them and then reform them, as Elizabeth Sackenter has told. So try to link your content from paper one. culture topic and write it here next is sc roy so sc roy is expected this year i have asked two questions in my 
test series on SC Roy. SC Roy was also asked last year. So, I think uh, the love for SC Roy has continued into this year also. So, discuss his different uh, contributions to different parts of anthropology. So, first he was a lawyer who then took interest in tribal people and then tribal problems. So, he was legal specialists who then took interest in tribal uh, cultures and problems and he was called as the father of Indian ethnology by J.H. Hutton because of his multiple ethnographic works on tribals of uh, in the Ranchi region like the Mundas, Oraons, Birhor. He has documented their ethnographic culture. So, describe those and then he also founded the journal called Man in India and uh, then slowly he gave up his legal work to focus on anthropological studies and though he took up a lot of studies and he also focused on Indological literature to also take up civilizational studies and not just caste studies and uh, he went to study other aspects especially he focused on folklore in his study of folklore of uh, Indian society and you can also include his influence. Initially he was influenced by Morgan, Fraser and classical evolutionists but later on he slowly was drawn into the functionalist approach of Malinowski. So, he was influenced by these western ideas and then after cultural anthropology he also contributed to uh, physical anthropology where he conducted anthropometric work on tribal people under the framework of P.C. Mahalanobis along with that he also took up some archaeological studies especially his archaeological studies focused on the Asur, the Asur culture and the pre-Munda inhabitants of Chota Nagpur. So, you can discuss all this and finally conclude by saying he not just focused on cultural physical archaeology he also had wanted to use his knowledge of tribal cultures to solve people's problems and improve their day to day life. So, he was a humanist on the whole and he was very empathetic to the plight of tribal people. But then in the end also write a criticism where you say though he wanted to help tribal people he thought tribal culture was in general uh, lower culture and he thought that they must be lifted uh, to the level of the civilization. So, he had empathy for them, but he did not really think their culture had lot of uh, positive elements. He thought their culture had to be reformed in the direction of a superior culture. And in the last, you can also conclude that towards the end of his life, S.C. Roy thought that we should develop an Indian approach to anthropology that is free from western influence. Indian approach to anthropology that is free from western influence. An approach one which is more spiritual in its orientation, an approach which is more spiritual in its orientation than materialist. Compared to western approaches like evolutionism, diffusionism, functionalism, he said Indian anthropology should stop being constantly influenced by western ideas and it must take up an original Indian approach to anthropology that is rooted in the spiritual traditions of this country and this civilization. So, that is uh, S.C. Roy. Then you have OBC. This is a very easy standard question. So, first define OBC. These are social as the constitution defines them socially and educationally backward. These are not economically, but educationally backward. And uh, the list of OBC is maintained by Ministry of Social Justice and uh, Welfare. And they are identified based on the social and educational parameters and discuss what is the background for them to give this. That is, these are communities who traditionally felt were within the caste Varna framework, but they were not Dvijas, but they came under Shudra uh, levels because of which though they were part of caste society, they were placed at the bottom and uh, they were excluded from higher activities like learning uh, and education. So, that is the reason for their backwardness and here also make discuss the observations of Supreme Court in Indira Sani judgment where Indira Sani said in India as per article 340 we have to identify backward classes and this judgment agreed that caste is a reasonable metric to identify class. So, it said that we can identify backward castes based on backward classes. Sorry, we can identify backward classes based on caste. So, uh, the judgment came to the conclusion that caste can be used as a metric to identify classes and hence it said that we can use backward caste as a metric to identify backward classes. So, that is the first part. Then second part is their features, present status and so on. Here you can talk about uh, for example, in the post 
independence era due to land reforms these people emerged as uh, landed sections that is the first major change then due to green revolution as we abolish zamindari system the these castes emerged as landed sections green revolution also increased their economic standing and some of them became very very strong castes like kurmis yadavs and so on and then with the mandal movement mandal movement was essentially an obc movement with the mandal movement they also got lot of political consciousness and political awareness and as a result some of these uh, dominant backward castes have set up their own parties and through these parties they have captured power and they have extended their control over the uh, regional and local setup for example uh, yadav set up rjd samajwadi party kurmis uh, are led by nitish kumar in jdu and so on so that is how backward classes began to become as dominant sections and but one of the issue that is bothering them is the issue of sub categorization among backward classes and to because of because we have given 27% quota to bcs this 27% quota percent quota is being captured by mostly the dominant section within the backward classes community so uh, they are demanding for sub categorization and to examine this issue rohini commission was constituted rohini commission was constituted to look into the issue of sub categorization and rohini commission submitted its report to the uh, government in last august and we are waiting for the government to take action on this report so this is how you can disclose you can discuss uh, backward classes as well and that brings our discussion of paper to a conclusion conclusion and i hope uh, all of you those who wrote the mains were able to include all these points and uh, improve your marks and others who are preparing for the next year i hope the discussion help you get some insight into the latest trend and get get some insight into how you must approach the paper in terms of strategy and what kind of practical techniques you need to put in place to handle paper in real time examination right so my overall judgment is this is a very easy paper where with uh, good preparation good answer writing practice a good test series and mentorship and uh, with good uh, planning you could have aced the paper and made anthropology as your foundation for success so i wish you all all the best and uh, please make the best use of this discussion videos thank you